focus on ourselves. Okay, with that in mind, um, let's begin. You guys ready? So I did make a note that the homework will be due on Wednesday. That's at the midterm, so you can turn it in at the beginning of the midterm. What I personally think is you will be off track if you don't have it done by Monday. But I don't want to force that. I know some people have corporate partners obligations this week. We've been a little bit late on getting everything done. So if you if you're running a little bit behind, you know, maybe it's like typing it up or writing it up nicely, that can wait, you know, until the Wednesday or something like that. But I really do think you need to struggle with this homework over the weekend. So I don't want to tempt you into waiting until Tuesday because you need to do all that studying for the midterm to be prepared. And it's gonna be my midterm, it, it's not going to be brutally hard. It's going to be things that you've seen over and over and over again. So I'm going to be drilling you on things that I really think you should know and should be able to do quickly. But the only way you can do it quickly at this point is if you've done the homework repeatedly. And so that's also go back through your old homeworks as well. See if you can do those problems, you know, without having to refer to your notes. So the midterm will be closed book. So no notes, you're allowed uh, a pen and, and some scratch paper, and I'll bring your scratch paper for you. So no formula sheet, nothing like that. So you're responsible for all of your distributions, expectations and variances would help you with that. So you can kind of imagine, I'll probably do one of those iterated expectation variance things, and knowing what your expectations are off the top of your head will make a hard problem really easy. So, Try to prepare yourself, um, but you do not have to turn in the homework until Wednesday. But I think that you should still be on top of all of this. Yeah. Okay. Um, I did write down the wish art distribution. This is what you would be using on problem six of the homework. Hopefully we can get there in this lecture. Um, you're actually going to be looking at the inverse wish art distribution for your homework. So this is the typical distribution you would put on sigma inverse, the precision matrix. I did give you a handout on the precision matrix. It's on the website. So if you want its interpretation and what I said very quickly in class, um, I wrote that all up for you. So there's a, a PDF on the webpage that you can read to or what the interpretation of the precision entries are. So I interpret them as conditional independencies. I give you that interpretation at the bottom of the PDF that I typed up for you. Um, and if, you're, if you've taken like regression when you were an undergrad, those are the same things as your partial correlations. So partial correlations and the precision entries are the same things. So you might not have thought about that before. Um, we'll be placing um, prior distributions on that big covariance matrix, and you can place the prior distribution on the precision as well. So um, you might calibrate it differently and think about it a little bit differently, but they are one to one with each other. Okay, so hopefully we'll get around to touching the, the Wishart distribution by the end of the class. Um, you don't need to memorize this for the test. I will never test you on the Wishart distribution. And truth be told, every time I code it up or I do anything with the Wishart distribution, I go back to my um, my tables. So I make sure I get it right, make sure I've got everything right, and so I've never bothered to memorize what this normalizing constant is. Saying that, for your homework problem, this part of the normalizing constant is the part that looks like the distribution, looks like it's T. So it's just like in the gamma analog, when you're placing the gamma on the precision, um, you're going to do the same thing for that last problem on the homework, and it's going to be a multivariate. We'll come back around to this. I wrote it all on the board because I can never remember it. So, so it's there, so we get to this problem. Let's pick up where we were last time. Um, detailed balance is this equation. And um, let's just label the parts of this. So this is the transition. So this equation applies in Markovian spaces. And so it tells you what the stationary distribution of something is. So this is the transition of moving from theta t to theta t plus 1. So I think last time I probably wrote it with theta t minus 1 to theta t. It's all the same thing. Um, this right here is the stationary distribution. 
And if I didn't tell you that this was a Markov chain, you would probably understand this equation is this is a conditional probability, and that's just the marginal distribution. And so in non-temporally indexed processes, that would be the correct interpretation. And so that exact same thing happens here. Now I could walk you through and show you more about stationary distributions and stationary distributions solve an eigenvalue problem and I can tell you all about what the eigenvalues represent and what the distance between the second and the first eigenvalue is. And the eigenvalues are all bounded by one. Um, I can tell you lots of stuff about that, but I would leave that for an MCMC class. We'd go into all of that theory. So this is kind of a light version. We'd probably build up this equation, but I think we can understand it intuitively. Where this equation comes from, that if this is the conditional probability, then that's the marginal distribution. Um, in a Markov process, we call it, we use different names for things. So transition rate. If it were a discrete probability, we'd call it a transition probability. And if it were a, a continuum, we would call it a, a density. So because we don't want to mince those two words and we want to treat it the same, mathematically we'll come up with a new word. We'll call it rate. This is the backwards transition. So if I took a Markov process and I just looked at the states forward in time that came from this forward process, the transition rate, so with those probabilities, if I just took that process and I looked at it backwards, that would be the backwards thing. And some processes are time reversible, that the forward and the backwards rate are exactly the same things. Um, let me just make a note, just so you have some examples. Note, um, this process right here, xt is equal to some coefficient times xt minus 1. We'll let this be bounded by one for the same reasons that we talked about before in an autoregressive model. It's not stationary if that's not bounded by one, i.e. the process will just drift. So if this is normal air right here, this process is time reversible. So this is a Markovian process, so it's Markov. called an autoregressive one process. That's the lag right there. If you regressed on two things, it would no longer be Markovian. That's called an autoregressive two process, an AR2 process. So if this is normally distributed, if you ended up looking at the realizations of this, so we start somewhere. If I started in the stationary range, then this thing would be stationary, right here. I'm not trying to make any funny patterns, so that probably should look like that. So I'm just not a very good artist. XT, those are the XTs. So the realization from this process right here, you can imagine if I simulated it, it would just look like a fuzzy cabinet. And if I took that fuzzy caterpillar and I took this block right here in the middle of it and I spun it around, you wouldn't be able to tell if you just were visually inspecting it. To me, at an engineering level, that's what reversibility means, is that I could spin around the samples and you couldn't tell me I did it, you couldn't see where I did it. So if I shift it all over the place, you couldn't tell me that I did it because it would be stationary. So the distribution would be the same at any time point. So this is time reversible. And you could work it out. So I could go back to this equation right here. I could figure out what the stationary distribution is. In this process, it's a normal distribution, and we could figure out exactly which normal distribution it is. And if you've taken a time series class, that was your first homework assignment. So probably something like that. Um, we're not going to do it here. But if I figured out what the stationary distributions are, I took the forward process, 
I took this, I divided over on the other side, I could solve for that. And I could prove that they have exactly the same distributions. And you could do it analytically and write it all down. And it wouldn't be a super challenging exercise. Say that, if I change this air distribution to Cauchy, funny things happen. So let's change that to Cauchy. I'll center it at zero. So this is actually going to be centered at zero when you do that. I've taken the intercept out, so everything would be centered at zero. Um, we could put in some scale in there if you prefer. Usually people would just write sigma. So, but just the same thing. So if I had Cauchy innovations, Cauchy errors, this process would look totally different. It would look like this. Cauchy's kind of look like normals. Like if I just showed you the bulk, the middle of a Cauchy distribution, and I said, is that Cauchy distributed or is it normal distributed, you couldn't tell. What gives you the ability to differentiate is what's happening in the tails. So I cannot look at a Cauchy distribution if you didn't give me one of the big deviations. If I plotted a histogram, I couldn't tell. So it's the deviations that give you the ability to realize it's not normal. So what would happen is this would kind of be looking like the other thing, that it would look very time reversible in these steps. But then all of a sudden, there would be a jump. And let's say the jump was very negative. Bang. So that would probably be even farther. And then what would happen is this would slowly drift back up. And it would be hovering around there. And then if the deviation went over here, same thing would happen. This would slowly deviate. If there wasn't another big jump in the middle, it could happen. And it would come back down, and it would hover in here. This is not time reversible. And so I could describe the forward process pretty easy. That's coming from this Cauchy time series. Um, the backwards thing I'd have to solve for its stationary distribution. It's not an extremely easy calculus problem. Absolute values show up in it, so it makes things tricky. Uh, but you can write it down. There is an analytical closed form of that stationary distribution. I can tell you what it is. It's not a distribution that you know off the top of your head. And then I can do the same thing, and I can take the forward process and divide and multiply by the margins and solve for that backwards process. And it would be a really weird equation. What would it look like if I were trying to innovate? It looked like this thing backwards, where it kind of slowly drifts up and then bang down. That's not Cauchy. That's something different. So that's a non-time reversible thing. And if I look at it in the forward and the backwards direction, it's not time reversible. So that's the, the notion of um, a time reversible distribution. So if that thing is that, it's time reversible. And if they're different, they're non-time reversible. I'll point out that a Gibbs sampler is not exactly time reversible. So if we ended up solving what the backwards distribution is, we could do this analytically. We won't do it today. But if, if we were updating random variables, let's call them x, y, z, and I sample from the full conditional for x, the full conditional for y, the full conditional for z, and I just iteratively did that, it would give me joint samples from x, y, z. What's the backwards transition? It would actually be the reverse direction, updating z, y, and then x. And so it's not time reversible, but in a very trivial manner. Um, I will point out that in the block metropolis sampler, these are time reversible. That's the part I'm sweeping under the rug. I'm not proving it, I'm just stating it. So I'm letting you know the thing that I'm not gonna give you a big lecture on. So Christian, does that bother you a ton? I told you something I'm not gonna tell you more about, barring time. But that's the part that we had spent a lot of time on. Christian's gonna be bothered about this, but you'll survive. Take my 5314 class at the next coming teaching. We'll fill it all in. Okay, um, so what we need to do is take the Metropolis Hastings algorithm and plug it into this equation and show that the stationary distribution is actually our posterior target. 
So our goal in applying the Metropolis Hastings algorithm is to obtain samples from whatever that distribution is. It doesn't need to be a posterior, but Bayesians use it on posterior distributions. Um, I won't prove detailed balance for the Gibbs sampler, but that might be an exercise that I might give you for homework, something like that. Um, so we know what the forward process is, because I can write down the forward process. I just need to encode that mathematically. I've already told you what the backwards process is. It turns out it's the exact same process. I can't tell the difference if I run it forward or backwards. That's the little part under the rug. If I didn't tell you that, you probably wouldn't even know that you missed it. So and I'd be able to just do that, but I don't like to do that. And so what our goal is, is to show that this thing right here, the stationary distribution, is actually that right there. It's going to be our posterior target. And so if you iterate through a Markov chain, I you iterate through a Markov chain that's connected to everywhere, that it doesn't trap you in certain states, um, and it doesn't have any funny patterns, doesn't have cycles in it, it can come back to the original state. So those are what's called the ergodic conditions. But basically, you're able to sample from anywhere and go from anywhere to anywhere. We talk about all those definitions, the connectivity of the chain, that the whole chain communicates with itself. We're not going to spend that much time on it. Um, if this process right here can sample from anywhere, um, then a stationary distribution, or a limiting distribution exists. The limiting distribution is stationary. So what we are actually getting from a Markov chain is you're running this process and it converges to something. That's called the limiting distribution. So, and I keep going back to this other word called a stationary distribution. And so limiting distributions are stationary if they're ergodic. So that means that I can go from anywhere to anywhere and I can come back in a finite amount of time and I can do it without any funny patterns. Um, it's fairly easy to show that Markov processes do that as long as the proposal is able to give me samples from anywhere to anywhere so that there I can eventually get there it doesn't need to be in one step it needs to be eventually so I can end up coming up with samples from a different from some part of the space where this lives so it's really trivial to prove that it just takes time does that make sense at least okay so if this chain can sample anything in the space where that thing lives in, then it's ergodic and it's going to be time reversible. And what we need to prove is that this thing, which is this function, this pi is that pi. I've abused the notation. It's not necessarily that pi, but we're going to prove that it is. So if we apply it in this context. So we need to show that this thing is these are going to be the same. It's the same distribution. So that pi does mean the same exact thing. We need to prove that that's our posterior. So that's the goal. Any questions? Lots of stuff. You cannot do this without staring at the algorithm. You need to know how you got from somewhere and how you used um, probability to get there. So let's write this down. So we want our transition rate. Theta star, I'm going to plug that thing in right here. Let's see this. Theta t plus 1 given theta t. So we need to write this thing down, figure out what it is. There's only two steps involved. So to transition from whatever this state is, so I'm thinking about a specific value for this, and moving to another state, I need to figure out what the rate is that I got there. So if there were a probability, I would say probability, and if there were a density, I would say density, but it's actually a mixture between those two things because I'm assuming that this is continuous, so getting whatever this value is for that to be theta t, it comes from this continuous process, so that's a density. And then, conditional on proposing it, then I have to accept it. 
And so what's the total rate of that? It's the product of those two things. So it's just like why you multiply two independent things. These aren't independent, they're conditionally independent. So I have to propose it and then accept it. And so that's just this. So this is gonna be G theta T plus one. Theta T times alpha. And I'm gonna be a little bit more clear about this, just so that we know what that alpha is. So let me just change this to theta star given theta t. So I'm moving from theta t to theta star. I said what I've updated, so my theta star is now accepting that move, whatever that, that thing is, this is either where I was last time or theta star. It's one of those two things. So that's the storage step. And so let me just write this down with the alpha being a little bit more clear. G theta t plus one given theta t times alpha theta t plus one given theta t. So those are the two things you need to do. You need to propose it and then you need to accept it. So those are the only two steps in this process. So that is the transition rate. Now we need to take some time and prove what the actual stationary distribution is. So I'm gonna get rid of this because I think we, well actually let me leave that up. Let me get rid of this. We know how we accepted it and then we stored it. That step is still down here. So let me just make a generalization. So without loss of generalization, W log, that means without loss of generality. I'll tell you what this means in a second. It means I didn't do anything, but I'm making my work. I'm gonna have my work. So I'm gonna make an assumption that I know Oh, and here's, a, here's one thing I want to do in this. I'm going to assume, we're going to make an assumption. Assume this is one. So I'm assuming that that's equal to that. So I'm assuming that my proposal is symmetric. The part I want to leave for you is to do this proof again and do it in the non-symmetric case. So I want to leave a little bit of work for you. So over the weekend, you try to do this exact same proof in the non-symmetric case. And I promise you, if you don't ask me lots of questions about it, that will come in very handy for you on Wednesday. So, but if you ask me how to do it in advance, I'm not gonna test you on it. Okay, so that's my trade to you guys. So I'm gonna do this proof in the case where this thing is one. I'm going to get rid of that. So that just falls out. The proof is equally as e easy in the non-symmetric case. Don't make a different um, without loss of generality statement. The statement I'm going to make is I'm going to say theta t plus 1, theta star, give it x, is going to be greater or equal to theta Give it so all I'm saying in this statement without losing any generality is I know which one has a bigger density. So if you gave me any two points in the world, I could plug them into this function and tell you which one has a higher density. So I'm just making it so I don't have to do the proof in both directions. So it simplifies some of our work, otherwise I'd have to do the proof in cases. So there's no need to do that because for any points, I can tell you which one has a higher density. It's one or the other. So I haven't missed any cases there. So does that make sense? So you give me any two states, and I can tell you which one is bigger, and I'm gonna assume that it's that one. Okay, so this is gonna make our proof real easy. What I would do in the other thing, so just as a note, 
I might assume something like this, theta star given x over g theta star given theta t, theta t is greater or equal to this other one. Theta t given x over g theta t given theta star. So this would be the analogous without loss of generality statement that I would make if I were trying to prove this in the non-symmetric case. Okay. So one way I like to think about this ratio right here, this whole thing, is it's actually the ratio of that to that. So I've explained it differently where I talked about the ratio of targets multiplied by the inverse ratio of proposals. But I could have talked about this quantity and say it's the ratio of these two things. So this over that is this exact same equation. Does anybody know what this quantity is called? It comes up all the time in Monte Carlo. Almost every Monte Carlo algorithm I know, this thing appears. So for AR sampling, except reject or envelope sampling, it shows up. So in important sampling, it shows up. And in MCMC, it shows up. It comes in through the ratio. That's actually called an importance ratio. So that's the correction that you make when you propose from something and you want to figure out the adjustment you need to make to turn it into samples from your target. Lots of stuff there. So I could draw you a picture and we could go over that. Again, my Monte Carlo class covers all these details. So you don't need it for this class though. So that's a little bit that might come in handy on Wednesday. Okay, I'm gonna start with that. So without loss of generality, this is true. Let's write down what our acceptance rate is. So, rho theta t given theta star. Whoops, theta t, this is plus one. I have an ability to change my notation eight times in the same direction. I think I've got it consistent though. T plus one. We're going to use that statement in a second. So, what did I need to do to, what, what is this thing right here? So I'm going to change that and I'm going to make it our theta star. So that will be theta t plus one. You can change the notation back if you'd like. It's the exact same proof. So, What's going to happen in our next iteration? What I have to do is I have to propose it. G theta star given theta t. So to get there, to even accept this move in the first place, I had to have proposed theta star. So now I'm thinking of theta star as an actual state. What's my acceptance rate? So this is times the acceptance rate. That's what's going here. So we have to go back and stare at this alveo for a second. Somebody work out that math for me. It's one. So why? Because of that. That's the part that I'm, that our without loss of generality statement is giving us. That I know that it's accepted and I've made the move. So this is one because of that. So I necessarily make the move. Let's go back the other way. Theta t given theta star. So assuming I've made the move, what's the rate of going back to the other location, the backwards transition? This is g theta t given theta star. First, I need to propose it. So I have to propose that backwards if I were in this state. So that part's really easy to think about. I don't have to think about time reversibility or anything like that for this, but I have to propose it in the first place and go back there and then I need to accept it. So what's the alpha in this case? 
It's not one. Somebody help me out. You can't tell without staring at the algorithm. In this case, it's actually a probability. So that's the alphabet. It's a probability. What is that probability? The other one we know, because our without loss of generality statement, I know that it's not one, and I know it's not bigger than one. So it's some other number. It's between 0 and 1. We're just taking the ratio? Yeah. <laughs> that's it. Just stare at this. It's just this thing. If I were doing the non-symmetric case, I would have to account for that. So that would appear. So this is going to be pi theta t given pi theta star. Oops, this is given x. How do I know that that number is less than 1? Of that. <laughs> so, so I know which one is one and I know which one is less than one. That's the without loss of generality statement. Again, if you didn't want to do that, you'd write down cases, and those cases would be exactly the same math. So people don't like to do that. So these are these two things. Right here. Now we're going to show what our stationary distribution is. So let me get rid of all this. And we'll do the last step. Detailed balance, I'm just switching the notation from my t plus 1 to my star. So, same thing that we had before. I'm just giving theta t plus 1 a name. It's the star, it's the thing that I've accepted. I've moved there. And so, we just need to write this thing down. So, this part right here, we've <coughs> already written down. So that part's just g theta star given theta t. So I've proposed it. If you'd like, I can write down the 1. That was the acceptance rate. And so now, instead of assuming that it's the posterior distribution, I'm just going to drop this function right down. So I'm not going to give it a name yet. So. Don't be confused about the, the theta in all of this, or the pi statement. They are the same pi's, but they're meant to be different functions. So I probably should have called this something different. So let me just change this real quickly, and I'll say it's some function. Just some function. I don't want to confuse you with the other pi, although it is that pi. We'll prove that in a second. So some function, we don't know what it is yet. That's what our proof is going to tell us. So this is going to be equal to, we've got our backwards transition. This is how I would have moved to the other place. The algorithm works entirely the same. And so I've got g theta t given theta star times pi theta t given x over pi theta star given x. So that's the first time we've seen the posterior distribution show up in this thing. Thank goodness, because that's actually our answer. So it should have something to do with it. And this is going to be times f theta star, some function. 
And this F and that F are the same Fs. That's the stationary distribution. This equation doesn't apply when you're burning in to everything because that's not converged yet. So, so now we need to figure out what F is. So a little bit of magic happens in all of this. So I can cancel these two things. How come? They're symmetric. So in the non-symmetric case, those wouldn't have canceled, but I would have had those other G's in here, and they would cancel with them. So the G's would fall out. And so now I need to figure out in general, so I've got F theta T over F theta star is equal to pi theta T given X over pi theta star given X. This needs to be true for all states. So I need to find the F such that this ratio is that ratio. And it needs to be true for all states. Now I won't make this mathematical proof. I'm sure it's long. But there's only one function in the world that I could evaluate everywhere. And it's exactly the same function. There's only one function that ever does that. It's the same function. It's unique in that sense. So, so what we've just proved is f of theta is equal to pi theta given x. So this is the big punchline. What's the stationary distribution in all of this? If this is the Markov transition, if this is the Metropolis-Hastings process, the stationary distribution is your target that you build in in the target ratio. So bada, bada bing, bada boom. That's what it is. So sometimes I have to think about what the reverse process is when I'm designing an algorithm. So a lot of times I come up with an algorithm and I need to figure out what the reverse probability is. I always go to detailed balance and I solve for it. In some algorithms, you actually need to encode it. So you can figure out what it is through detailed balance. So following this equation will verify if you come up with an idea how to transition somewhere, you've got to make sure that you've encoded the reverse move properly in the algorithm. You can figure out exactly what that reverse move is because detailed balance is the thing that you're going to check. And it'll tell you what that is. And so now you can go and create MCMC algorithms. So it's up to your creativity on figuring out what your forward process is and what the trajectory is. So if you know your contours are really weird and bendy, you need a process that's going to be able to move in that, that mass. So. I don't know if I can say any more than that because every time I come up with an algorithm, it's more like a creative sort of thing. And I'm like, oh, here's a function that could bend like this. And then I figure out how to make an MCMC algorithm out of it. Anyway, that's the whole kit and caboot right there. If we ended up filling in all the details on limiting distributions, and stationary distributions, and time reversibility, we'll have everything. But I don't think you need all of that to be able to use this. Any questions? Okay. Give it a shot for the non-symmetric case. That will be a valuable thing to do over the weekend. Okay. Let's go to the rat problem. This is where all the Wishart stuff is going to come in. So we'll pick up with the Wishart distribution next time. But let's look at this paper, let's look at this model and this paper by Gelfand and Smith. So Gelfand and Smith got together with some scientists. They were doing something to some rats, and they were looking at over time how the rats put on weight. And they had this key question of is their initial weight associated with their propensity to put on or take off weight? And it turns out the answer is yes, they are associated with each other. And you can look in the paper and figure out if that's a negative thing or if it's a positive thing. They put on weight more because their initial weight was higher or does that lead the rats to take off weight? 
it has everything to do with what the science was actually studying. Now, I don't think Gelfand and Smith cared at all about that. I think they just wanted to write Gibbs sampling paper and do some Gibbs sampling. So it kind of feels that way when I look at the paper. So you can look through their results, and I'm going to ask you to actually take their data set and code up those full conditionals I'm having you work out on this homework. You'll do that on the next homework. And so you'll have to pick priors, and you might have to read their paper and figure out which priors they used. And I'm going to ask you if you think their analysis was reasonable. I have a little bit of suspicions. So I think that they put a lot of weight on their priors so to make everything work. <coughs> you will be the judge. So here's their model. So this is going to be the rat weight. Rat eye, eyes, rat eye weight at time t. So I'm going to write it down like this. Also for your full conditionals, you're going to ask me how many time points does it go from, let's just say one to cap t. You can use that letter if you'd like, and there's going to be, I don't know, um, I goes from 1 to N. It's the typical thing. It's kind of weird. It's always I goes from 1 to N, <coughs> I goes from 1 to cap I. But everything else doesn't follow those rules. Okay. So here's the model. So it's going to be each rack has its own parameters. We discussed this at some point last week. So hopefully this isn't totally brand new. But this is going to be normally distributed with some variance. So the way we understand this model is some version of time series, but it's like a pretty clunky version of time series. So what I'm doing is I'm regressing on the actual time. So Time is going to be some index. It's going to go from 1 to cap t. If beta is positive, this is going to be an increasing function. So they're going to be accumulating more weight as time goes on. And if beta is negative, oh, and let's make that a 0. If beta is negative, then they're going to be decreasing weight over time. And every rat has its own parameters. Those parameters are somehow a proxy for the rat's genetics whatever it is that the scientist is studying. You know how this stuff is. So we do things to rats all the time, see how they behave, and we hope we can extrapolate that to humans. And maybe we can. Um, this is the initial weight of the rat right here. That's its propensity to put on or take off weight. So that's the idea in all of this. So a scientist did something to a bunch of rats, and they collected a time series of all of these weights for each one of the rats. And they're going to compare some treatment groups. You can read the paper. Um, big question is, is, are those associated with each other? And what you guys should recognize is that if we didn't place a random effect on this, we wouldn't be able to estimate those parameters. So we have one rat, and we don't have any variability across the rats to estimate those parameters. And so we wouldn't be able to estimate those parameters for each and every rat. So what we do instead is we build a random effects model. I'm going to call this alpha i, beta i. This is going to be normally distributed. This is going to have some mean in it. I'll just call it um, <coughs> mu. So this is going to be mu alpha, mu beta, if you will. And there's going to be some covariance matrix. And so this thing is going to be sigma squared for alpha, sigma squared for beta, and then I would have these covariance terms. Sigma for those two things right here. These are the same, alpha and beta. So that's the same as right here. So the name of the game in this whole experiment is try to measure that and show that it's not a zero. So 
so they're associated with each other, something far removed from zero. So that's what Gelfin and Smith were interested in measuring. And so they wanted to estimate all of these parameters. And so what we're going to need, if we're going to estimate all of these parameters, is we're going to need some priors on some stuff. Just keep in mind, this is a random effect distribution. It's what it's idea is is that there's some population out there this is an abstraction and there's some mean of the rat parameters so and there's some distribution of rat parameters in each rat upon being born selected a couple of its own parameters and those are these and they're coming from this distribution and so by tangling all these things together associating them we're able to estimate everything. This is called a random effect. We don't need a prior on alpha and beta because it's already random. And if I didn't tell you that this was a random effect distribution, if you're a Bayesian, you wouldn't even wince at this. You'd go, I don't care what it is. I'm going to operate on it like it is a prior. But if you ever go into a room with unindoctrinated Bayesians and you start talking about random effects distributions, it will start a riot. So people will ask you, how do you think of that distribution? Is that a random effect? No, that one's a prior. Is that a random effect? No, that's a prior. That one's a random effect. They look and feel exactly the same. But the reason you're placing them is because of either you're modeling something, and what we've taught you so far about priors is we're trying to induce certain properties in a posterior. So the reason you pick a prior and the reason you pick a random effect might be different. This is done for modeling purposes. And a prior is usually picked so that it gives you some property in the posterior, or you're able to encode your subjective knowledge, depending on how you think about it. But it looks and feels like a prior, so we don't need a prior there. What we do need priors on is all these other distribution, all these other parameters. So we're going to need a prior on that thing, probably. 1 over phi is sigma squared. So quick question. Which prior would you pick for phi? What's that? Maybe 1 over phi. That would make your life easy. So let's pick it to be some gamma. And that would encapsulate your choice. It's the limit. And so it's going to have some parameters, alpha naught, beta naught. In the paper, they put the prior on sigma squared, and they used an inverse gamma. And their alpha naught and beta naught, I think their choices, they didn't convince me when I read the paper that those were reasonable choices. I think they needed those choices to take out some of the variability in their posterior. So they did the thing that most people accuse Bayesians of doing. You know, just picking priors at random. You can read through the paper and look at their choices. What would you pick for mu? That thing. We're going to need a prior on that. Some normal. You're going to have to pick choices. Mu naught, and there's going to be some sigma naught in there, those are your hyperparameters. Not to be confused with this parameter right here. That's a different sigma. So you can use a different letter if you'd like. And we're gonna need a prior on sigma. And which prior would we pick for that? And that's where the wish sharp comes in, right here. So what I wanna come back to is I wanna show you that the wish sharp distribution is the conjugate prior for sigma inverse, and the inverse wish sharp is the conjugate prior for sigma. So we'll go through that next time. We'll show that it's conjugate. We'll write down the likelihood function for this entire process. And then your goal is going to be to take that likelihood function and figure out what the full condition is. And I'll walk you through that a little bit next time. So and that will be that. OK. Any questions? Perfect. Thanks, you guys.